can see you and have promoted you to be a panelist. Mm, and I can see Lauren promoted that to be a panelist. I can see you now. Let me promote her. Hello? Hello? Yes, you're live. Dr. Muhia CMO, kindly you'll advise us when to when to start. I can see the participants are still joining. Patricia? Yes, uh, Dr. Muhia, now you can kindly carry on with the program. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Good morning all and welcome to our webinar this morning on breast health awareness. And the reason why we are doing this webinar is because cancer of the breast is one of the non-communicable diseases that is of public importance because it causes uh, death and more so amongst women. However, using appropriate epidemiological methods such as screenings helps in planning preventive strategies and implementation of effective control programs. Our speakers this morning, we include experts from University of Nairobi, University Health Services and the current hospital. We are partnering with the current hospital. And to take us through our webinar this morning, 
the speakers will include Dr. Mayabi, who is a general surgeon and laparoscopic surgeon from the current hospital. Dr. Karo Kinoti, who is a radiologist. From the university side, we are going to have Dr. Kabare, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist, and Sister Wafula, who is our chief nursing coordinator at the university. To take care of the QA and the chat, we will have other members, both from Karen and University of Nairobi. From Karen, we'll be joined by Dr. Let me get the name correct, Dr. Kara Irongo. And then from the university side, we'll be having our deputy chief medical officer, Dr. Mioro, Dr. Gitare, Dr. Kara Odura, and Dr. Kinama. So to start us off, we will have Dr. Kabare, who will give us the introduction. And her presentation will include signs and symptoms of cancer of the breast, the presenting complaints, and she'll touch briefly on some of the risk factors. After Dr. Kabare, we'll have Sister Wafula, who will take us through how to do self-breast examination, which is critical because this is something we are supposed to be doing on a monthly basis. Uh, followed by Dr. Mayabi, and Dr. Mayabi will touch on the confirmation of the diagnosis, surgical and non-surgical management. And last but not least, we're going to have Dr. Kinoti, who will take us through the rationale and guidelines of screening and the role of radiology in the screening and various radiological investigations that we can use and use it for management as well. So I want to request our ICT team to upload our first presentation and Dr. Kabara will take us through. Thank you. Dr. Kabara, if you can hear, kindly of take us through the first session. And to our attendees, please note you have a question and answer section from your side. You can start set, sending your questions now. Thank you. Dr. Kabare? Can you unmute yourself? We can't hear Dr. Kabare. Maybe I can assist her to go through the slide. So let's go to the next slide. She could be having some technical issues. And in our presentation as part of introduction, what we need to take cognizant of is that the most common cancer amongst women worldwide is cancer of the cervix and in Kenya it constitutes about 
percent amongst all the cancers among women. And in Kenya, it also ranked that amongst the commonest cause of mortality, where number one is cancer of the esophagus, and number two is the cancer of the cervix, and it is ranked that as one of the commonest cause of mortality in Kenya. This cancer is more prevalent or more common in the low and middle income countries where we fall in. And therefore it is important for all of us to know that screening and getting the disease at the early stage is of paramount importance. Next. What are some of the risk factors that are associated with cancer of the breast is that the gender of an individual whereby it is more common amongst women compared to males, age, the more elderly you are, the higher the risk. Three, family history and genetic mutations. If there's family history of cancer of the breast in your family, then it is important to note that you are at a higher risk. And the other important thing to note is about the monthly period. Those who get their monthly periods early are at a higher risk, as well as those who get into menopause at advanced age. Nalipality or those who do not have children are at a higher risk, and those who do not practice breastfeeding when they have their young ones. Other risk factors include hormonal replacement therapy, and this is normally practiced by women when they are towards their menopause and they want to replace their estrogen. So that one becomes a risk factor. Another risk factor could be the oral contraceptives that we take to gap our children. And some dietary factors, including alcohol and saturated fats. And last, amongst the risk factors that we're going to mention this morning is the radiation of the, it's not necessary to do an X-ray, you avoid it because it could be a risk factor for cancer of the breast. Next, what are some of the signs and symptoms of cancer of the breast. And what I need to let members know is that there's really no test which can be done in advance for you to be told, like a blood test for you to be told that you have a cancer of the breast. So it is important to make sure that we know how to examine ourselves and come up with the very early signs and symptoms of the disease. So one of the things that we must be on the lookout to know is a lamp or a swelling. And most of the time it is painless or change in the size of the breast and shape. If you find that your breast has changed in one way or another, then you must seek for help and ask somebody to examine your breast fully. Then skin changes, and these skin changes include dimpering or like there's a small depression and the skin tends to tether. And at times you also get some redness or some rashes on the skin of the breast. And you can also have some nipple abnormalities, which include retraction. It tends to like it's being pulled to the inside, or you can have an isolation. And last but not least, is that you can have discharge from the nipple, and it is worse if it is bloody. So if you find that you're having a bloody discharge from your nipple, it is important to ask for help. And this is just a, a summary of what we have just gone through. So if it is a lamp, you feel a swelling on the breast. If it's the pulling in of the nipple, it will be like it's being retracted inside. The dimpling are those swellings I've just mentioned that it will look like you have a small dimple on the breast and then dripping, meaning there is a discharge coming from the nipple, or you can have the redness or change in the color of the skin on the breast. So those are some of the, the summary of the signs and symptoms that you need to be on the lookout. Next. 
So how we how do we do the diagnosis of breast cancer? One, it is important to have clinical examination by a doctor or a clinician. And from the clinical examination, it is important to give the history of those signs and symptoms that we've just discussed. And after that, the clinician or the health worker who's dealing with you will do an inspection and palpate to know whether the things that you've reported exist and whether indeed it is a lump or just the breast tissue that you are feeling. Then secondly, there's the imaging and the confirmatory one is the one that you do with the histology. You take a tissue and you take it to the lab for investigation to confirm that indeed it is something suspicious. Next. Next slide. Things and according to what you've just said is that you'll be looking at the breast size, is it symmetrical? Are they the same size or is there one which is larger than the other? Is there a change in the skin color? Is there an abnormal people retracted and the other one is okay? So you must make sure that you do all the proper investigations and examination of all, you look at the two breasts together. And because at times the at times the diagnosis or the the swelling may have spread to other areas, it is important to look at the regional areas. And the regional area now includes the armpit and on top of the collarbone, whereby you'll be looking at whether there are any swellings in the in the regional areas to know whether the disease has spread or not. And other areas to look at is the bones because the disease can spread to the bones, so you'll be having bone pains, difficulties in breathing if it has gone to the lungs. And if it has gone to the liver, you may have something we call jaundice, and this is yellow coloration of the eyes and the skin. Or if it has gone to the brain, you get some, some neurological symptoms like you may have like weakness on one side of the body, or you have altered consciousness because the disease has gone to other sides of the body. Next. This is about breast examination and one of us is going to take us through this in details, but there are various ways of examining the breast and I will allow Sister Wafula to take us through the details of how to do proper self breast examination. So let's go to the next slide. Next, Patricia. So this is about, I said you can do lab investigations. And lab investigation involves taking some tissue from the breast and taking it to the lab for, for examination. And it can either be a biopsy using a, a gun whereby you just take a small tissue from where there's a swelling or you excise the whole swelling and you take it to the lab so that it is confirmed that indeed, whatever you are looking at is not something benign, but something malignant. And after that, depending on the definitive diagnosis from the lab, you'll be able to treat the different types of cancers because as we'll be told later by one of our presenters, we'll be looking at the different types of cancers and how they progress and what type of treatment is normally given to different types of those cancers. Next. So who do we screen? Who is at a higher risk? We've already said that those who are elderly are at a higher risk. And therefore, when somebody is about 45 years, they need to be screened at least once a year. And those between 20 to 40 years to be screened every three years, depending on the risk of an individual, because we have already said, like if there's a family history, then you need to be more vigilant and get more screening of the disease because it's one of the risk factors. Next. Treatment and management, this one will be covered uh, in details by the other presenters, but basically it involves all this 
whereby you can have surgery, you can have drugs, and that is chemotherapy. The treatment may involve radiation. That is why we're having one, uh, one of the panelists to be, to be a radiologist so that she take us through what is the treatment in terms of radiation. It can be hormonal therapy and it can be immunotherapy. Next. And I think that was the end of Dr. Kabare's presentation. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all those who have listened to me. And I believe it is important for all of us to keep chatting our questions. There are people who are responding to the questions on the chat. And therefore, if we don't answer your question, we are going to tackle it during the QA session. So thank you very much, members. And I want to usher in Sister Rebecca to take us through the next presentation. If members don't mind, I want us to tackle the questions at the end of the sessions. So our next presentation will be on how to do self-breast examination. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Dr. Muhia. I'm going to take us through the breast self-examination. Next slide, please. Breast self-examination is the process that an individual can follow to assess the physical wellness of their breasts. And the step simply involves uh, looking and feeling as we've heard uh, from uh, the presentation from Dr. Kabare. And this morning, our, 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 main, our main message to all of us is that uh, we need to, to have breast health awareness and this basically means the conscious effort that each one of us needs to put in, in checking the breasts every month by looking and feeling in order to detect anything that is abnormal or any changes that are abnormal or unusual. Next slide, please. The question we ask ourselves this morning for those who've not been able to do the self breast examination before is then that any changes in skin color and the changes can be reddening of the skin or darkening of the skin. And here we want to put a caution again, this is we are talking about anything that is new on the skin color of the breast, not the, the, the bath marks or any other colors that have since been there. We are looking at uh, and, and looking out to, to, to not any persistent pain that is abnormal. Again, there's a caution here because uh, during the cycle, sometimes there the could be pain in the breast. And therefore we need to differentiate the usual pain that comes with the changes in the cycle from any other persistent pain that is happening in the breast. We are looking out for itching, scaling, thickening of the skin and darkening, which I've already mentioned. And from our earlier presentation, again, this was mentioned, we are looking out for any unusual discharge from the nipple, like the blood or pus. We are looking at nipple changes like pulling in or inversion. And again here, it's only if the nipple had, was not inverted before. Anything that is happening differently from the usual. Dimpling or pulling in of the skin is also a, a change that should be looked out for when you're, look, when you're doing uh, self-breast examination. 
And, there, and then lastly, we're also looking at lumps. Next slide, please. When should one perform self-breast examination? This should be done every month, preferably around the same time of the month. And here I'll talk about three categories again. For, for men, this can be done, you can choose any time of the month to do the self-breast examination. For postmenopausal women also, you can choose any time of the month because they, you do not have the influence of the menstrual hormones. But for women who are still in a reproductive age, you will need to pick at the, the deaths that come after your menses so that you move away from the menstrual hormones influence. And uh, here we are recommending two to 10 days after the menses. Next slide, please. How do we perform the self-breast examination? We have said that this is a process that follows steps. And this morning I'd like to take us through how to do proper self-breast examination. The first step is to look. And here we are saying you will need to remove clothes on your body. Standing in front of a mirror, you need to just observe. Look at the shape of the breast. Look at the size of the breast. Not any changes. Look at the skin color of the breast. Not any changes, again, that we've already mentioned in the earlier presentations. And you also need to look to, to also move from the breast tissue all the way to the armpit area, as it had also been mentioned earlier. So we have said that the first step for us to do is to look. The second step that we need to do is to look again. And here we are saying that apart from just standing in front of the mirror, you will need to move your hands around. And this is just to enable you be able to look at the, different, at the breast tissue from different angles. You need to place your hands on the hips and look at the breast tissue. Again, all the way from the breast tissue to around the armpit area. Then lift your hands above your head. This will allow you to be able to see the areas under the breast tissue that are not visible when you're, you're just uh, observing. And we are saying that for any abnormal mass that could be in the breast tissue, it will not move. It's usually stuck, it's usually not mobile. And therefore, you'll, when you move your hands up above your head, if there's any abnormal tissue under your, your, your breast, you'll, it, you'll be able to see pulling of the skin or dimpling of the skin. And that is something that should be noted. And the, the next step is to feel then using your hands. And here we recommend you use your first three fingers. These first three fingers, you will need to use, I'll, I'll, I'll use my knuckle to, as, as a, an aid for the breast tissue. With your first three fingers, you will use the soft part of the three fingers. Kindly do not use the tips of your fingers because if you use the tips of your fingers, you will only feel the normal breast tissue under the skin because you'll be separating the breast tissue under the skin. What we would like you to do is using the soft pad of your fingers, place your hand on the breast tissue firmly, beginning from the nipple, which is the center, and moving out of the breast tissue. Therefore, press gently and firmly to press down the normal breast tissue so that you can feel anything that is standing out. We, 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 in, we would like to, to inform you that uh, the, for any abnormal tissue, it will stand out. It will feel different from the normal breast tissue. And therefore, as you press in or probe your breast tissue, you will be able to feel anything that feels different under the skin. 
move from the nipple area out into the, the breast tissue and move all around the breast tissue. Feel for anything that, that is different uh, under the, the breast. And again here, I would like to say that when you're palpating, move in circular, in a circular motion. Do not, uh, do, do not uh, skip some areas. Move continuously around the breast tissue without skipping any area. And uh, from what we will be able to see on the next uh, slide, we'll be able also to look at other ways to, to do the palpation or the, 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 the probing of your breast tissue. You have the option of doing the up down movement around the, the, the breast tissue. You also have the option of doing the wedges around the breast tissue and then also the circular motion around the breast tissue. The, the final part of uh, our examination should involve squeezing the nipple to look for any abnormal or unusual discharge. And in this case, we are looking at blood, a clear fluid that looks like that, 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 could, that, that is different, usually does not come out of the breast. And especially if it's not a, a, a lactating mother. And also, pass. To the next slide, please. So this is the visual aid for the breast examination that we've just gone through. We are saying that you need to pick a, a, a time that is appropriate for you. In this case, for reproductive uh, age women, we are saying uh, after your menses. We've gone through this, all of it. Uh, and I think uh, that is a good picture to just uh, show what we've uh, uh, gone through in the previous slide. Next slide, please. And here I would like us to note that uh, again, we should, we should not confuse the normal breast tissue with the, the abnormal that we are looking for. The abnormal lump or breast lump will feel like a hard knot. It will feel like a marble. It will feel like a pea and it will not move. That is what we are looking out for, even as we do the monthly breast examination. Next slide, please. And so we ask ourselves, if you happen to feel anything abnormal during your monthly breast examination, what are you supposed to do? Kindly visit your doctor for a clinical breast exam and further in investigations. And here we would like to remind all of us again this morning that the normal month, the, the monthly breast examination that we are talking about does not replace your appointments with your doctor for a clinical breast examination. Please keep your appointments with your doctor, even as you continue with your self breast examination. And the message for the, the take home message for today is make breast examination a health habit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sister uh, Rebecca, for that uh, insightful uh, presentation that you've done. At least you've learned about self-examination and uh, what to do, what to look out for. And the key notes is that it does not replace the doctor's appointment. And our next presenter is going to be Dr. Hans Mayabi, who is a general surgeon from the Karen Hospital. He's going to talk to us about screening and management of uh, uh, breast uh, cancer. And uh, I can see the presentation is up. Uh, Dr. Mayabi, please. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Doctor. Okay, good morning. My name is Dr. Mabi. I'm pleased to be joining you this morning for this uh, breast cancer uh, webinar. So I'll be talking about uh, screening and management, the same. So the objective of my talk will be, we have the risk factors screening, confirm the diagnosis, what is surgical and unsurgical management, and then how do you follow up? So as you look at the risk factors, I think um, I'll go probably in the next slide. The main thing is age and has a relative risk of more than times 10 risk. So an elderly patient, usually someone above the age of 55, look at the reproductive risk factors. If you have menarche 
quite early, then that um, usually before the age of 11, and that's a huge risk factor for uh, about a, a, a threefold risk factor for getting uh, breast cancer. Then uh, age at menopause, when menopause are above the age of 54, then they have a two, two times risk for the same and you age at first pregnancy. So actually, ladies are actually advised to have their first baby before they are 40 or ideally before they are 30 to do that risk. The life tech factors which you can actually modify, which we call the modifiable ones, either your diet. So people who take high intake of saturated fats, those who take alcohol excessively, and those who are actually uh, have a, a BMI of more than 35, meaning that they are bordering uh, 100 kgs in, in body weight, then that actually increases between 1.3 to 2 times the risk of getting it. Then looking at the hormonal status, those who use oral contraceptives, which puts you at, at, at uh, risk and currently, specifically using uh, progesterone-based um, hormonal contraceptives, and also hormonal replacement therapy when you visit for more than 10 years. If they're postmenopausal and you're having symptoms and you want to alleviate them, then this can actually increase your, your risks. Radiation to the chest, especially after the age of 10, and a family history of breast cancer in a first degree relative, whether it's your mother or your aunt, then usually causes that. When you come to screening, who are the high risk patients and non high risk patients? So for those people who don't have the risk factors, who are non high risk, so every month they do a self breast uh, examination at the same time, at, starting at the age of, of 20. And then this then followed up by a breast examination by an experienced professional every two to three years between the ages of 20 to 39 and nearly after the age of 40. Then you have an initial mammogram at the age of, of 40. So we advocate that anyone who's below the age of 40 to do an ultrasound, but above that should do a, a mammogram. Then subsequent mammograms every one to two years from the age of 40 to 50 and every year after, after the age of 50. When it comes to high risk patients, like the ones we have just discussed, they should have a monthly breast self examination at the age of 20. Then, an, with an experienced uh, professional at least twice a year, starting at the age of 25. So, every six months, if you're high risk for breast cancer. Then, an initial mammogram at the age of 30. This should be followed up with an ultrasound in case, in case they find something suspicious. And then, the subsequent mammogram should be one to two years until the age of 40 and, and yearly after the age of 40. So they actually, their screening uh, starts earlier and is maintained earlier and with the shorter intervals. Then of note is in women between 35 to 60 years of age, any breast mass is cancerous until proven otherwise. And that's, that's the, uh, the, the main story of why we screen them. So just looking at this image here of many women, um, we say that about a thousand women there, of those four, you look at the red box there, that shows four will be malignant. We'll have a malignancy, meaning that the, the, the love of a cancerous lesion. And 16, and 16 out of, a, of that 1,000 will have only benign, which means if you screened all of them, 980 will be normal. Four will probably have a, um, a cancerous lesion and 16 will have benign lesions. And that shows that Breast cancer per se in a in, in our population of women is not so high as, 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 as it's thought. Just, just trying to bring it at it. But we know that it caused a lot of grief within the, fa the family and, and also a lot of anxiety, especially when you have a lady who has a lesion that, that they, are, they are presenting to you with. <laughs> I think my colleague, Dr. Kinoti, will talk about this later. But when you're looking at the breast imaging, both ultrasound and a mammogram, we usually use this, this is called the BIRAD system, that's used to show whether you need further evaluation, whether it's suspicious and needs a biopsy, or where you need to follow it up. Of note is the most common finding is usually BIRAD2, which is benign. And then about, uh, I can say about, about five to six percent usually BIRAD3, which means a short interval follow-up, about six months. But what you worry most about is a BIRAD4, where you should actually biopsy them. BIRAD5 is only highly suggestive of malignancy, and now you move on what to confirm the diagnosis. So how do you confirm the diagnosis? First thing is um, 
the gold standard is actually an image guided needle biopsy. Then you can also do what's called a true cut or an incisional biopsy in areas where they don't can do an image guided. The advantage of the image guided is, is you go to the lesion and get what you want without missing it. A true cut might sometimes miss it. An incisional causes a lot of trauma. And sometimes might, if it's malignant, you can cause some bit of spread. And also we will affect um, what happens when you when you want to do a definitive surgery. Then if, if, for instance, you found a lady already has, you did your imaging and you're suspecting that this is cancer, you look for, you have to, the next step is to look, is to find whether they have metastasis, meaning that has spread away from the breast to other tissue. The most common place of spread is usually the bone, but usually start with the CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis, because sometimes in women you can have what are called contiguous tumors or what you call Kuchenberg. So you can have them associated with the, the ovary, especially in ladies, and sometimes also colon, colon and the, the stomach. Then you do a bone scan to see whether it's spread to the, the bone and, and usually a, a PET scan, just a CT scan to see whether they've gone to other areas of the body, but it can also follow, be followed up with a bone scan. So when you come to the surgical management, the surgical principles are one is to establish a diagnosis, and then two, to completely eradicate the primary tumor, and then determine the regional nodes that are involved with metastasis. And this can either be, with, you, you can either be done um, either with the wide excision with the radiotherapy for local tumors, what is called the breast conservation therapy, your mastectomy, meaning removing the whole breast for larger, or multicentric tumors. Multicentric means you have more than one tumors within the same breast at different locations of the same breast. And as you do all this, you also have to remove axillary lymph nodes for accurate staging so that you know what they need, what you need, what they need uh, radiotherapies usually after. So if you have early cancer, which I'll, I'll, I'll discuss later, the intent is to cure and the mainstay is surgery. Then what is called locally advanced cancer, which involves not only the breast, but also the, the, the nodes regionally there. So the intent is still cure with surgery as the mainstay. And if there's metastatic cancer, the intent is palliation, unless you're having a tumor that is eating away the breast. So we do what is called that, and it's causing either smell or it's causing bleeding, then that's when you do surgery. But the intent here is just palliation, meaning just controlling the pain and, and the quality of life of the patient. So early cancer, you have a size of tumor that's less than five centimeters and the, and the axillary nodes, meaning the nodes in, inside the armpits are mobile and there's no skin involvement, meaning there's a lump, but there are no skin changes. There's no nipple changes or retraction at, at, at that point. Then a locally advanced cancer, where the size is more than five centimeters and you can have what, is, what are called fixed axillary nodes or there's something called a super supraclavicular no, uh, nodal involvement, I means just above your, your breastbone, you'll find the node there is actually enlarged. And either have skin involvement, skin and, and nipple involvement. Then I said you can have metastatic cancer and the most common site is the bone followed by the liver, then the lungs. So there are, there are various forms of uh, surgical management. Um, there are three actually. So you can either do a modified radical mastectomy which is the most commonly done. I think it's because most centers in our, in our country don't have what is called a frozen section, meaning it was to remove a lump, I meant, I meant to know within that seating that my margins of that lump are clear of cancer. And that's why many people within the country will be, uh, many women who have breast cancer will be given a modified radical mastectomy. So there's a muscle below the breast that is called the pectoralis major, which is spared. Initially, there used to be a disfiguring um, surgery done that was called the radical mastectomy that involved removing the muscle, but it caused a lot of disfigurement and never, never improved on, on um, survivability. So it involved the removal of breast tissue, the nipple and areola complex, the skin, and the nodes on the same side. Usually, radiation is not typically given, but that is usually um, alluded whether depending on how many lymph nodes are positive for cancer and it's not indicated in, in metastatic disease. Then you can have a simple mastectomy where you just remove the breast tissue and uh, including the nipple and the, and the skin 
but not no nodes. And this is done for what is called lobular carcinoma in situ, meaning the, the cancer, it's a precancerous stage. So both for involving the lobules of the breast and what and the ducts. So the other duct, duct ductal carcinoma in situ or lobular carcinoma in situ. And then what we are trying to move into in our country, which has been in other countries for a long time, is what to do a, a reconstruction. So you can either remove the whole breast and, and reconstruct at the same time, or you can remove a lump and re reconstruct at the same time. Initially, if you look at the image on the to your, to your far left, that's what used to happen. You'll remove the breast, that's a modified radical mastectomy, and there'll be no breast on that side. But after that, um, some people will come for a second operation and have a, either filled with an implant, either a silicone one or a saline one, or they can use what is called a vascularized flap, which means you either take a muscle from your back or from your, or from your tummy and put it under the, the dark skin to form a breast. But these days we do what is on the far right where you're able to remove the breast tissue, the one that is affected with cancer, and at the same time, reconstructed or put in a silicone implant, or, or uh, the one fill, filled with a uh, saline, where you get one from the back and, and bring it forward and put it there. Usually avoid this in stage three and four cancer. Stage four cancer is already metastatic, and usually you're just trying to, 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 to give the, the, the lady, either they're bleeding or having a, a very, or are having a very smelly wound. So you're trying just to do what's called a toilet mastectomy. In stage three, usually in, in, involving the skin, and sometimes the nipple, and, and usually the outcomes are not so good in terms of recurrence. So there's something called a breast conservation therapy, which we are trying to, as, as of now, we are trying to push to have most women have it. You'd rather have your breast instead of um, reconstructing it. And this is usually in early breast cancer, stage one or two, where you do a lumpectomy or remove what is called a segment of the, of the, the breast and close it up. The caveat for this is usually you need to have what are called clear growth and histological margins, something, something that can be done that is called a frozen section. So you remove that and then make an incision in, into your armpit and remove some lymph nodes. And then you can either give, and then followed by local radiotherapy to the entire breast. So, so that to, um, to prevent any recurrence. And this has actually shown that has same outcomes with the same as a, a radical mastectomy. The ideal size of the tumor should be less than five centimeters, but these days, as long as it's not involving the nipple and the skin, it still tend to, uh, to do a breast conservation and sometimes even augment the breast at the same sitting and then give the uh, local radiotherapy after. So let's just show you what you usually do. Look at the first image to the upper right. That's how we mark it when you're going to do a, a mastectomy. And then the second image just above it, the upper, to the upper right is what happens after we have closed. And then, but when you want to do a, a breast, a nipple, or what we call a nipple sparing or a breast conservation therapy, then we use the last image to, to far right on the down. So that take a quadrant on the first one, you can take a lump, but, but you, you tend to give a five centimeter margin around, uh, all around so that um, you know that you're able to conserve the breast, and that's it. So there's what we call non-surgical management, and that is why you use both chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, immunotherapy, and a combination of either of them. Breast cancer is what we call node, uh, node positive disease and, and, and um, receptor positivity, meaning the main hormone um, in, in, the, in, the breast, in breast cancer is actually um, estrogen. So you want to do, know whether it's estrogen receptor positive or negative. The other receptor that also use like progesterone or uh, what's something called the HER2. But the mainstay is what you find out is, uh, is it estrogen receptor positive or negative? And then are the nodes positive or negative? The nodes you remove from the axilla. So if you're having a node negative disease, you first ask yourself, is this a postmenopausal woman? If yet, if yes, if they are estrogen receptor positive, then we do what is called hormonal therapy after. 
So in, in conjunction with whether you did a breast conservation and, and you have to give radiotherapy because in breast conservation, you give radiotherapy, then you combine radiotherapy with hormonal um, therapy. And that is up to five years. If there's estrogen receptor negative, you don't give any adjuvant um, therapy in a postmenopausal and not negative disease, meaning the, the axillary negative. We have premenopausal woman who's uh, estrogen receptor positive, then you give the adjuvant chemotherapy means what you give after surgery, and then you add tamoxifen. If they are estrogen receptor negative with not negative disease, then you give an adjuvant chemotherapy and then you do what is called an individual risk assessment. There's something called, uh, um, there's, there's a DNA test that is done that is that is helps to know what your individual risk is of cancer within the next recurrence within the next five years. It's called Oncotype DX, the, the test that can be done. It's usually very expensive, but sometimes we even just use the history and examination findings to, to assess the individual risk. So people who have a node positive, actually, when you have when you have node positive disease, that actually says that this person has what is called locally advanced um, tumor. Uh, tumor, and if they are uh, premenopausal and they are estrogen negative, then just give chemotherapy. If they are estrogen receptor positive, you give both chemo and followed by tamoxifen. And also, uh, you have to give radiotherapy. One who's postmenopausal, who's ER negative, you give only chemotherapy, but the benefit is only for patients, but the benefit is for patients less than 70 years. Those are above 70 years. You don't know whether whether there's any benefit because you're looking at their life their life expectancy and whether it will really help them. But if they're estrogen receptor positive, then you give them both tamoxifen and chemotherapy. So finally, um, how do you do follow up? So a patient who has breast cancer has already undergone the full treatment. They need initially a two a, ideally a twice a year follow up with your physician. Initially, they say for the first two years. But I think because we're in a setting in Africa where we find that most people will present late, then it's actually recommended that they have a twice yearly follow-up for the rest of their life. Then an annual chest X-ray and liver function tests to actually see if there's any uh, metastasis. And then if you did a um, breast conservation therapy, you should have a mammogram every six months for two years, the first two years, and then annually. And there's no role for tumor markers because sometimes you might have no raised tumor markers, but you have cancer. So not, not shown to show whether there's any recurrence early enough. So in conclusion, let's have to remember that one in eight women we love will be diagnosed in cancer, with breast cancer in their lifetime. And then just the factor that can help lower the risk of breast cancer is one, having a healthy weight. So a BMI of less than 25, not smoking, having physical, daily physical activity, at least a brisk walk of 30 minutes per every, for five days in a week, or anything that will take your heart rate up 15 minutes every day, and no alcohol use. So just to say that early detection is the key to prevention. So you don't ignore any lump or nod in your breast, self-examine your breast regularly. And in case you're above 40, get your mammogram, mammogram done and avoid al alcohol and smoking. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mayabi, for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to at least to thank everyone, uh, to thank for the presentation we've seen. At least we've now known that tumor markers have no role, and at least we shall continue doing the examination and uh, come for confirmation of diagnosis. Uh, the next presenter, I'd like to invite Dr. Kinoti Kiende. She's going to talk to us on the rationale and guidelines of uh, rationale and guidelines and the role of radiology in the management. And at this point, I'd like to request our participants, if you have any questions, to please put them in the Q&A so that uh, the, the some that will be answered and the some that will be tackled at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Dr. Kinoti.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to share with you um, about in this breast cancer webinar. I'll be talking mostly about the role of imaging um, in screening and diagnosis of breast cancer. So we've heard uh, from the previous um, presenters that globally breast cancer is the second most common cancer um, amongst both all cancers uh, in men and women. And it's a fourth leading cause of mortality in all cancer deaths worldwide. And in African women, breast cancer has been shown to peak earlier, that is between the ages of 35 and 45, which is approximately 10 to 15 years earlier than the peak in Western countries. So overall, um, in Kenya, breast cancer is a leading cancer uh, in terms of numbers prevalence. This is according to the Global Cancer St Statistics 2018. It's, uh, in Kenya, it is the third leading cause of cancer deaths uh, after cancer of the cervix and cancer of esophagus. The available data in our country shows that majority of our patients actually present uh, much later late in the late stage in advanced stages of the disease, which contributes to the higher mortality and the low overall survival. Um, my colleagues have talked about the risk factors, so I will not dwell much on that. So breast screening, there are three components um, in screening. The first one is genetic screening, whereby um, genetic markers are, tested, are uh, tested in the blood. These are mutations to certain uh, genes that predispose one to breast cancer. Then breast screening itself, this is the imaging aspect, which I will go into, and the overall cancer prevention, which Dr. Mayabi has talked about, um, the lifestyle modification. So what is the rationale for screening? So um, data shows that if breast cancer is diagnosed in the early stages, um, that is while the disease is still localized in the breast, the five-year survival rate is up to 96%. This uh, five-year survival rate decreases as the, decrease, as the disease advances. Um, in regional disease, the five-year survival is 78%. Uh, and distance disease, this is where there's metastasis to other organs outside the breast, the survival rate is 21%. Therefore, um, screening for early detection is an important aspect in the control of breast cancer. And the primary goal of screening is to increase detection in the early stages so that you can improve uh, survival and reduce mortality. The screening guidelines that we currently use in Kenya, um, usually it's recommended that for women um, between 25 and 34 years, you should have a clinical breast exam at least every three years. A clinical breast exam is a breast examination done by a qualified healthcare worker. Um, for women between 35 to 39 years, it's recommended to have a clinical breast exam and either an ultrasound or a mammogram. Um, this depends on certain factors and this should be done at least every year or every up to every three years. For women uh, between 40 to 55 years, um, we recommend having a clinical breast exam and a mammogram annually. And um, for women above 56 to 74 years also, having a clinical breast exam and a mammogram every two years. And for women 75 years or older, um, we recommend discussing with your healthcare provider on the best um, way forward. <laughs> So what is uh, breast cancer screening? Screening is detection of cancer before it causes symptoms or before it causes any serious health problems. It's important to note that screening is not preventive and it's not foolproof. So the screening methods that we have currently include the physical examination, that is either the clinical exam done by a healthcare worker or the self exam done by the individual. Then mammogram, which is actually the gold standard method for screening in breast cancer. And we also have supplemental imaging uh, modalities that are used um, 
in addition to mammogram in certain specific cases. This include MRI and breast ultrasound. Um, as Dr. Mayabi had alluded, there's no blood test that uh, detects breast cancer. So the role of imaging in breast cancer is one, to diagnose breast cancer, to evaluate the stage and the extent of the disease, that is whether the disease had, has spread outside the breast. And it's also used to guide uh, biopsy of suspicious lesion. Who are referred for breast imaging? So there are two groups of women who usually are referred to us for breast imaging. Um, those without symptoms, these are asymptomatic uh, women, that is where the screening comes in. And those with symptoms, this is where diagnosis comes in. It's important to note that um, men also uh, can be referred for breast imaging. Men can get breast cancer as well. Um, in 2018, it's estimated that more than 2,000 men worldwide were diagnosed with breast cancer. So we'll start with mammogram. As I said, uh, mammogram is the gold standard for screening in breast uh, cancer. That is for detecting um, abnormalities in women who don't have symptoms yet. And um, a mammogram is a X-ray image taken of the breast. It's recommended for women above 40 years. So mammograms use low dose X-rays to examine the breast and it can be used both as a screening and as a diagnostic tool. And the goal of mammography in screening is to detect early cancers through detection of either abnormal masses or small um, calcifications that we usually call microcalcifications. Now mammogram, uh, yes, it uses radiation but um, the radiation dose in mammography is, is very low. Um, it's not significant enough to cause um, secondary effects. So fear of radiation should not stop one from getting a mammogram. So these images show how a mammogram is done. This is a lady um, getting her annual mammogram. So simply, um, you'll be asked to change into a hospital gown. Then the, you stand in front of the mammogram machine, which is an X-ray machine, as I said. Then one, each breast is imaged separately and each breast, so the breast is placed uh, between two plastic plates and then it is flattened or compressed. And this compression helps to get a clearer picture and a more accurate diagnosis. So a mammogram, the advantages is that it's very, it's a very quick exam. It takes a few seconds. Um, you do not require any preparation at all. So you can just walk into the hospital and get your mammogram done um, without having any preparations. Um, as I said, men can also get mammograms, as we have seen, less about um, less than one percent of breast cancers occur in men. So in men who have suspicious uh, masses in their breasts or lumps, they can get mammogram depending on the amount of breast tissue they have. So this is the compression I was talking about. Um, probably this is how it feels like to have a mammogram. The next uh, modality I will talk about is breast ultrasound. Breast ultrasound is different from mammogram in that it uses high frequency sound waves to make images of the breast. Uh, breast ultrasound is used mostly either as a follow-up or an additional test after an abnormal finding on a mammogram or a clinical breast exam is found. So ultrasound provides information that is different and complementary to a mammogram. The benefits of an ultrasound is that it can be done in any patient, regardless of age. Um, it does not use any radiation, and it, it is also um, more available and uh, more affordable. Uh, this is a picture of a lady getting a breast ultrasound done. Um, again, so the 
the, the, there's an ultrasound probe, which is what the nurse is holding, the lady. Um, this uses sound waves and then it produces um, images on the breasts, which is what we see um, on the screen. And we can be able to detect any abnormal masses or any suspicious uh, tissues in the breast and um, recommend further testing. The next modality we have uh, is breast MRI. Um, an MRI is also different from mammogram and different from ultrasound in that it uses magnetic field to create an image of the breast. So breast MRI can sometimes find cancers in dense breasts that may not be seen on mammogram. Um, in MRI of the breast, we additionally use intravenous contrast, which is injected into the vein to further enhance abnormal tissue or abnormal masses. A breast MRI, in breast MRI, each exam will produce hundreds of images of the breast uh, in cross section in three, direct, three dimensions. Um, we can be viewed from in, basically in 3D, which are read by a radiologist. So breast MRI is recommended as an adjunct to mammogram in screening women who are deemed to be ha at high risk of breast cancer. And it is not recommended for screening women at average risk. The advantage of MRI is that it is non-invasive and there is no radiation involved. However, the disadvantage is that uh, the cost is higher than a mammogram and a breast ultrasound. So this is an image of an MRI machine. Um, so you lie on a table, which is then um, pushed into the gantry in that circle that you see there. And then the technologist then proceeds to take images and uh, intravenous contrast is injected as well and images are also taken. Finally, um, I'll talk about ultrasound guided breast biopsies. So this is the one, this is one way of finding out if a breast lump or abnormal tissue detected um, during screening or during uh, imaging is cancer. Um, so it's important to note that not all breast lumps are cancer. And the only way to determine whether a lump that has been detected is cancerous or is not is by doing a biopsy. So during biopsy, a portion of the suspicious tissue or uh, the lump is removed. And then the suspicious tissue is examined under a microscope by a pathologist who checks for presence of cancer cells and makes the diagnosis. So an ultrasound guided biopsy uses uh, the same ultrasound that I had talked about, sound waves. And then um, this ultrasound is used to guide the needle that takes the biopsy into the breast. Um, the benefit of an ultrasound guided biopsy is that uh, the needle is guided specifically to where the abnormality is or to where the lump is. So um, the accuracy is in the accuracy and the yield of the tissue for histology is increased. So please remember that a scan, uh, whichever it is, that is mostly a mammogram, will see what you cannot. So it's important to get your breast cancer screening done uh, today, if you haven't already. And finally, uh, it being Cancer Awareness, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, Karen Hospital has re reduced the costs for all these screening modalities that we have. So please feel free to visit us and feel, um, have your screening done as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kinoti, for your lovely presentation. At least uh, you've given us the rationale and why this is better than the other for cost and for our screening purposes. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to also ask those who still have questions and still put it, and maybe we can have the panelists to answer a few questions. 
uh, any burning questions? Let's. There's a question uh, that's been asked. Uh, which nipple discharge is serious? Discharge uh, that drives on its own or discharge that comes out when the nipple is squeezed? Maybe one of the panelists uh, can give an answer to that. Um, so which nipple discharge is serious? I think yeah. first of all, you need be pressing your breast nipple to find out is a discharge because most times, if you're still in a reproductive age, uh, age group, you'll probably have a discharge when you press your nipple. So that's what I indicated. The one that is serious is one that comes out, you probably at the end of the day, you find that your dry is wet and you not press your nipple. And that has to be investigated. The most common thing is what is called a ductal ectasia, meaning that the ducts are actually blocked and now you either get infected and you're having a nipple discharge or not. And it can range to anything from what is called straw color, which is brownish, to blood stain. Most times it's benign, but we know that the majority of cancer starts in the duct, so it's actually good to have, have it investigated uh, initially. So I'll say if you pressed and something came out, usually it looks like milk or lighter, and that's usually normal, especially if you're in a reproductive age. But anything that you find either your bra is wet at the end of the day or you noticed it just coming out without you having to press on your breast, then that is what needs to be investigated um, um, initially. In terms of whether it comes and goes away, most time it's because the um, ductal lactase is actually resolved on its own. But that means that if it came, if you notice it once, then just at least have an ultrasound to look at the ducts and make sure there's no, no growth within them because you could have what is called a papilloma, meaning just a, a small growth on the lining of the ducts that could start and then progress to become um, breast cancer. Okay, I hope uh, the person has understood. And the next question is uh, about fibrocystic breasts and uh, the differences in breast lumps. Okay, I can I can still tackle that one. I know okay. fibrocystic breast disease is, is a common thing um, noticed by many women, especially as they approach uh, menopause. One, it happens in women who have already had children who are breastfed. So by the time you have fibrocystic breast disease, most times you're in the final stage of breast development. So the breast goes through four stages of development. The final stage is actually the cystic stage. Third stage is called the adenoma stage, and that's where you have the lumps at that point before mostly when, they are, when the women are younger, during teenagehood and early adulthood. But fibrocytic breast disease, as it stays, it's usually as you approach menopause, so there's a lot of hormonal imbalances. And one thing just to mention is when a woman has a has periodic circle, apart from a uterus um, preparing for a pregnancy, the breast also does the same. And you notice that towards the end of the cycle, the breast become fuller in some women and sometimes it also causes a bit of pain. And that's because the breast is also preparing for um, a pregnancy. And that, and what happens is if, let's say you now you have your periods, you're not pregnant, your breast goes into a process called involution. And that means that fluid has to be reabsorbed back into your body and goes away. But that, as you get older, that, that um, system or that action doesn't, is not foolproof. And so you have some areas where you have scars on top of them, what, what the fibro starts, stands for, and then with fluid filled within them, that's what it's called fibrocystic breast disease. So you have pockets of, of fluid within the breast. Most, most of the time it's, it's they're usually um, benign, but if it keeps pro progressing, it can actually transform because it irritates the, 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 the ductals, the ductal and the, what you call the lobular system and can sometimes it's rare, but can progress into uh, breast cancer. Just to mention about treatment, cause someone can ask about how do you treat um, fibrocystic breast disease? What's recommended usually is, and what I've been shown to work in African women is vitamin B complex. So sometimes we give it to them and then follow, follow them up initially the first six months closely, then, then, then um, yearly after that. Now, when it comes to the various breast lumps, you can have uh, what is our simple breast lump, which is a fibroadenoma, meaning usually that's in 
uh, teenage ladies and and teenage to early uh, early um, adulthood who have not yet have had uh, children. So you can have that uh, fibroma, which is benign. You can have what is called a lipoma, meaning a fat collection within the breast itself. Yeah, you could have also also what are called cysts, just simple cysts. So it's a collection of fluid can happen during every cycle, no pain, and sometimes usually it's incidental. And then you can have also skin, skin things that evolve in the skin because the breast is a modified sweat gland. It's part of what you call a skin appendage. So you can have things like a sebaceous cysts. You can have uh, um, epidermoid cysts, which are, which are a collection of, of sebum below the skin in a hair follicle. And then finally, what you worry most about is a cancerous um, lesion. So those are the various forms of uh, breast lumps that you can have. Oh, and lastly, you can even have an enlarged lymph node because the breast also have lymph nodes, usually towards the side as they go into the, uh, the armpit. And you can also have a, what you call an intramammary lymph node en enlargement, either because you're having an infection, either in the chest or within the breast tissue. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, there's a question that is asked here, and I also sometimes find it being asked uh, in the various consultation. Does breast cancer and the type of bra women wear have a connection? Okay. <clears throat> no, I don't. There's no correlation between the breast, uh, breast cancer and the type of bra. I know it's a very common, including whether it, the, the metal band below it or whether it's plastic. There's not been shown. And also another thing is about another question usually common you ask is your deodorant whether whether a spray or the roll-on have a collection with breast cancer. Those have not been prov proven to show. What has been shown to, to actually You able to hear me there? No, I think there was a small hiccup in your connection. Okay, but what I was saying, yeah. there's no correlation between the type of bra and breast cancer. It has not been proven whether whether and whether you have a metallic band, whether the type of bra that you wear, it has not been proven to show that it correlates with, uh, with the causation for breast cancer. The other thing I just added is whether, whether your DO, deodorant that you use, whether it's a spray or a, or a roll-on, has an effect on, cause, on causing um, breast cancer. Both have not been proven. What has been proven to, to have a correlation for you to be at risk for getting breast cancer is your age, so an elderly person, and your lifestyle, so smoking, excessive alcohol intake, a sedentary lifestyle, and taking high saturated fats. Those have been shown to actually increase your risk of breast cancer. And now the other things are the use of hormonal contraceptives. Yeah. I can see from the chat, uh, most of the questions that are being asked uh, were well done in the presentation before. So they are asking whether they can get the presentation. That one will... Uh, We'll uh, organize the various presenters and then we can see how we can be able to share the presentations with the rest of the participants. Uh, another question that has been tackled, gynecomastia and risk for breast cancer in men. So gynecomastia depends on what age. One, if it's, um, if, if, if the, the patient is usually a teenager, and that is usually what is called physiological. That's due to hormones. And usually by the time they've outgrown their teenage or adolescence, that usually goes away. So there's no relation to breast cancer at that point. The gynecomastia that comes because you're taking alcohol can predispose you to form, forming breast cancer. So what, that's when we say when you have man boobs, then you're probably at a risk of getting breast cancer because that already shows that the alcohol, the excessive alcohol intake just just affects your liver and, and you tend to have distort the hormonal profile from, from testosterone to more to estrogen and progesterone and that can predispose you to 
uh, forming breast cancer. But that now depends on the age and, and alcohol use. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question here. Uh, why do many cancer treatment operations tend to be more expensive as compared to other diseases? Dr. Maybe I think the person we are meant maybe on the chemotherapy or surgery, I know it usually has a, the same same cost. Maybe you dance on the surgery part and then maybe someone else would answer on the chemo. So, so the question is? Um, why, why, why are the cost of treatment so expensive compared to other diseases? Of cancers generally? Yes. So um, one, if I talk on a surgical point of view, mm -hmm. and just generally, uh, the cost tends to be to be to be more expensive as compared to other diseases because one, if you want to conserve your breast, sometimes what what you have to do is to give you chemotherapy before and see whether you have a response or to be conserve the breast. So that chemotherapy already takes away the. Um, am I being listened? chemotherapy already increases the cost. And then now the type of the surgery involved also increases the cost, especially with breast conservation, because you need things like frozen section, which needs a pathologist who's on board to do that for you. And then there are things, when you're taking the, uh, the, the lymph nodes, you might need what is called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which needs a, what is called a gamma probe, which also costs, costs money. And then now after that, including the histology and everything that's been done, it, it will let you know whether you need, what else you need after, um, whether you need radiotherapy or chemotherapy and how many cycles. So, and that's, that's what increases the cost. And then finally, the cost of follow-up is also there. So you need to be followed up for almost for life. And sometimes if you have a recurrence, it might actually increase your costs. Another small thing that might increase your cost is your response to chemotherapy. Sometimes you might have what I call it opportunistic diseases because of the chemo, chemotherapy itself. And now that might either delay and cause you to be able to treat it for other conditions before they continue the chemotherapy. And that now increases also cost. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, maybe another question is, uh, can keloid on the breast result in a lesion? Maybe you can call on uh, Dr. Mioro. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, correct, this is Dr. Mioro. Sometimes when one has a, a keloid, that can, uh, is one of the possibilities, as uh, Dr. Mayabi said, this is part of the skin. Sometimes that can be a keloid, but then that uh, a keloid can be part of the lesions, but then that is something which is benign. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe on the chat group. Um, okay, maybe at this point I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Lucy Mu here, the CMO, to Give us a word or two, Dr. Mohia, please. Thank you, Dr. Kinama. I have some other questions which have come through the email. And one is, can they explain the area signs and symptoms of breast cancer before any changes are noticeable? And I think this one has been covered by the signs and symptoms. And then another one, is kindly demystify that assumption too late for the diagnosis of breast cancer. And I want to request Dr. Mioro to take that one to demystify because we've been told that there's no blood test to be done to do early diagnosis. And then another question from the email is what are the faster methods of treatment and diet required of patient of early breast cancer patients. That one we can give to the physician. That will be Dr. Caro Irungo. And there's another question. Can development of 
breast cancer be determined by blood group of the person and the genetics? Maybe Dr. Karo Irungu can also take on that being a physician. And the last one from the email, uh, if your breast has something very hard, what could it be? That one we can give to the surgeon, Dr. Mayabi. So kindly let's do those ones as we come to a close of our webinar this morning. Now, now this is Dr. Mioro. One of the things that uh, the presentation has brought up is that one of the best ways of uh, making sure that you have got health of the breast is we have to have kind of a relationship the way um, uh, was presented by Rebecca. We have a, at all times, uh, every, once a month, make sure that you examine your breast, uh, look at your breast so that you are conversant with what is normal. And at all times, when it's possible, make sure you, you follow the health signs you have uh, said. Avoid smoking, no alcohol, your weight should just be the healthy uh, uh, proportion, then you'll be okay. But then in case there's anything which is there, the best way is to have this uh, done very early. After the, the clinical breast examination, make sure, depending on your age, you are getting the radiological tests which are done. And once we pick it early, then in terms of treatment, there are a number of things which are done and actually you are thinking about cure rates. That's what I would say about that. Thank you. Uh, Doc, um, Dr. Mab, and me and Dr. Rung wanted to be able to repeat the questions that were asked so that we answered them just now. Okay, one of the questions is, can development of breast cancer be determined by the blood group of a person? And two, the genetics or inheritance. I think that one was covered in the presentation. And the other question was, what are the faster methods of treatment and diet required for patients with early breast cancer? Blood group, can we start with the one of blood group? Is there a blood group which is more vulnerable or at a higher risk? So far, there is no evidence to show that a, a certain blood group is at a higher risk of developing just breast cancer. However, there are certain genes that have been associated, genetic mutations that have been associated with breast cancer. This does not mean that if the mutations are present that you will get breast cancer. I think about 5% of uh, women with breast cancer have those genetic mutations. So the most common genetic mutations are BRCA1 and BRCA2. And there are other several genetic mutations. Thank you very much. About diet, I think it has been covered, the saturated fat and then avoiding obesity. Yes. Uh, yes, and then there was one about if your breast has something very hard, what could it be? And this one, I think our surgeon is in a better position to answer. Dr. Mayer, be kindly. So I think it's very hard to know what it is. You have not examined it because you'll have to look at yes. um, the person as a whole, their age, their risk uh, factors, how long the, that hard thing has been there. And then, and then now examine. And then, and then the next thing is to know which is the appropriate imaging. So what I'll advise if someone who has a hard thing on the breast is actually sick, go to a professional uh, uh, person to first examine and then give the appropriate imaging so that you're able to know what it is. Thank you. And there's another one which has come in. Well, how do you differentiate between lump and breast tissue? How do you differentiate? So that, that's hard. How do you differentiate I think between this one is more is, or less the way you examine your examine breast? It. So maybe you can ask Rebecca to just take us through again how you do breast examination and how you do the breast examination so that you are able to identify the lump and not the breast tissue. Rebecca, maybe you need to clarify because it's coming as a question.
Yes, Dr. Yes. I had spoken concerning. Can you clarify? Yes, please. I had uh, talked about the how we can be able to to differentiate the normal from the abnormal, which we are looking for as we do this breast self examination, or then go in for the clinical breast examination. What we are saying is that the abnormal tissue does not move. And that's why we are saying when you raise your hands, you're able to see the difference in the skin as it pulls back the skin. The, the, the abnormal lump or uh, breast tissue will feel hard and will stand out from the normal breast tissue. And then the usual description is uh, that is given is like a marble or like a hard knot or like a hard pea. Thank you. Thank you very much. And at this point, I think we come to the, the end of our session. And I want to request Dr. Kinama to give a vote of thanks for this session. Kindly, Dr. Kinama. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mwihia. I'd like, first of all, I'd like to thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Stephen Kiyama, for leading us into celebrating this uh, Cancer Month with uh, awareness on this session. We know with the COVID-19, things have changed, so we tried to do online. I'd like, uh, we'd also like to thank the current hospital CEO, Dr. Juliet Kikonyo, for partnering with the University of Nairobi in extending the awareness through this webinar, and also to further thank them further for the subsidized cost for screening. From the presentation you've heard that screening is uh, something we cannot get away from and screening is something that should be done on a regular basis for us to be able to take care of ourselves. And uh, I'd like to thank our presenters for the elaborate and quite easy to understand the presentations that have gone through and at least have generated questions. We thank also the panelists for answering the questions in the background. We also like to thank the participants for joining in and making this uh, awareness campaign a successful event. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to close it at there. Maybe you can hand over for a word of prayer as we close. Thank you very much. And I request Alan Wasilwa to pray for us to take us with God's blessing as we close the meeting. Alan, kindly. Thank you so much, Madam CMO, Dr. Muhia. Could we kindly believe for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, how we want to thank you for the meeting that we have just held. We just want to thank you for the success of it, how educative it has been to us as a, a people and a community, how we just pray, Lord, that you be able to guide us, you be able to help us, Lord, through this uh, uh, disease which has been um, a menace to our community, Father. Lord, even we, the health professionals, we just call upon you, Father, to lead us through, to help us, Father, even to manage our patients better as we go on. Lord, as we finish this uh, meeting, we just call upon your presence to be with us as we go on with the rest of the day and even other activities that are before us in our various areas of call and service. As we go on, may we go on with you the rest of the day. For it is just as we believe and pray. Amen. 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 Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.